Well, welcome. Uh, I just announced to the other folks, and you may have just walked in, where there's a change in program. Where, uh, the first session was supposed to be database on a cloud, which was showing how to install uh, BSD, or excuse me, Postgres, running in a cloud instance on a virtual machine running FreeBSD. But that talk's not happening. Doing something a little similar, this is an introduction to all database basics. So, um, if you want to stay, you can or leave. <clears throat> this is also like a part one of a, the next talk uh, after this one I'm also doing, and it's uh, a little more advanced saying, um, about database normalization rules. <clears throat> so, me, I am a software developer, not a regular DBA guy. Um, I've spent decades building customized uh, database apps for businesses. And uh, nowadays I focus on doing um, uh, Java, Vaadin, and Postgres. Vaadin's a Java-based uh, web app UI. It does desktop-style apps, uh, but deliver them through a web client. And uh, I am here as part of CPUG, the Seattle Postgres user group. So we, run, we have a monthly meeting in Seattle, so if you're ever uh, available and interested, you feel free to drop in on our meetings. You can meet us on meetup.com. And we have a booth here, so there's some great world-class uh, world database experts uh, that you get to talk to for free and ask questions, what would normally cost you money. So I encourage you to take advantage of it. So databases. Databases represent stuff in the real world. Uh, we've got some examples here where veterinary uh, has stuff like customers, doctors, visits, animals. Dormitory, we're going to have students. There's rooms. Students get into rooms, so that's the assignment. Um, publishers have books, authors, and then there's money involved with publishing, so there's a royalty. And invoices, we've got things like customers, the invoice, and the line items on the invoice. So each of these things, the first job when you're um, doing your analysis for a project is to identify these things. The technical word is entity. <clears throat> so after you get your idea of the entities, then you need to look at the uh, technical word is attributes. These are going to be the columns on the table or the... Uh, uh, fields on a record, same, different terms, same thing. So a book is going to have a title, it's going to have an ISBN number, it's the standard number system for books, and you might have a description. Um, the author is going to be, um, it's going to have a name, contact phone number, contact address information. Similarly, we're going to have names on students, and we're going to have room numbers on every room in a dorm. So the catch here is you need to identify your smallest chunk of data that you ever want to search or sort on. So for example, here in author, we have name, just one field. But over there on student, we got first name, last name broken out. So the difference is over in the student dorm system, apparently <coughs> we expect to want to do reports by last name. We're going to want to search and sort um, by last name or first name. Whereas in author, we don't care. So it all depends on the business context. I'm going to talk more about that in the talk next uh, hour. So what we did in the previous slide, this is we're setting up the structure of our database. Now what we're going to do is populate it with actual data. So in that name column, here's some example data and the phone and the address and so on. And of course, i got three rows here. Postgres, you can have millions upon millions of rows in a table if you want. Um, next, I want to talk about the data types. Uh, there's a lot of data types. Well, first, what is a data type? It is a chunk of data. Hi there. Uh, this talk changed, by the way. We're not doing the cloud talk. This is an intro to database concepts. Okay. So, data types. Um, uh, it's kind of funny. I have a friend who uh, loves networking and security stuff, which I hate. And, uh, and I do programming, which he hates. And every time he tries to start programming, the very first thing in a programming book is data types. And it says he puts them right to sleep. Because I think mentally he just expects data, um, you know, text numbers, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that every different data type means that the database can understand that particular kind of data. So for example, we have text and we have uh, numbers. 
And the difference is you don't multiply or divide or subtract number uh, text, but you do numbers. So when the database understands this kind of data, it can do things like uh, total up the numbers um, to give you a grand total for a bunch of rows. And uh, so let's walk through a few of these. The text ones, you think this would be simple because text seems like to be basic, but it's not. The, the standard, there is a standard for databases um, called SQL, the SQL standard. Um, <laughs> most databases comply with the standard to some degree, and all of them extend it, go beyond the standard, or do things a little different. So there's no one, no database that perfectly complies with it. But anyway, the standard term for a character field is varchar for short, very, um, what's the long word, variable? Varying character is the full name. So what it means is uh, uh, in the old, old days, databases like mainframe days long ago, they often um, had a fixed length field. So like a first name might be 20 characters. My name's Basil, so it's B-A-S-I-L, it's only five, but it would actually store all 20 characters. It would store five and then maybe 15 more spaces um, or some other character to pad it in. So this bar chart doesn't do that. It actually, if you type in just Basil, you're only gonna store five characters in the database. You're not gonna have 20 fixed. You can put a maximum on this, but um, uh, in, in uh, I think Postgres ignores it if I can't remember the limit. No, I guess it enforces the limit. If you say if you say I want 20 characters, if you put in more, it'll get truncated. Um, text is actually if you're just doing Postgres work and you don't care about porting to other databases, just use text. Um, it stores uh, up to a huge amount of text. I can't remember up to two gigs or something like that. Um, Char is for individual characters. I think I haven't even used it. Text is what I'm all, always going to use. Clob is short for character large object. This is if you have really enormous amounts of text. Uh, and you look in the manual, it'll tell you what that number is. So if it's way, if it's super huge and too big for text, then you put it in the clob. And what the database does is store that separately inside its own database, it kind of puts it to the side, so it doesn't, uh, it's for efficiency. So that otherwise the behavior is similar. With integers, um, we have, uh, uh, eight bit numbers, 32 bit numbers, and or 16 bit, I think, 16, 32, 64 bit. So this is simply, it means it's gonna take up more space in the database, but you get a bigger range of numbers. So the 32 bit is up to uh, plus or minus two, two billion approximately. So for a lot of purposes, you would just use integer. Um, oh, and then there's always some alternative names, like integer spelled out is the same as I-N-T-N. Big end is 64 bit. The um, fractional numbers is what really screws people up. And actually, it's a good thing to understand when you're beginning is that there are, there is a way to do fractional numbers. So, what we mean is like 1.5 when you have a decimal fraction on the end. Databases or computers do not represent decimal numbers in fractions perfectly. So, what that means is you can put in 1.3 and get 1.3000000000 and then some other digits. So that is using floating point technology. And you can look up floating point in uh, Wikipedia and you'll see there's a section in that article that says accuracy problems because you are trading away accuracy to get really high performance when you're working with those numbers. So it works great for science engineering purposes that little tiny fractional error on the end is usually not a problem. If you're talking about money, it's a big problem. You don't want some tiny fraction that's accumulating in your uh, uh, money amounts um, and often being masked because all you see is like the pennies and don't realize that there's this little tiny fraction. So what you want in that case is exact fractions. So for money, always use these. And I think the Postgres um, manual even mentions this that for money do not use the floating point types. There's a bunch of, uh, there's a bunch of other data types. Um, Boolean is just true or false. <coughs> Some people use a number for that. They just do zero or one for true or false. 
um, Postgres actually has an actual Boolean type. Uh, there's a bunch of date time types. Uh, that's a whole, actually that's a whole other talk I do. Um, date time is actually a complicated subject. Uh, but there are several of uh, those types. Uh, UUID is for universal, universally unique identifiers. So that is actually a standard where you use a 128-bit value. So you can represent, people often think that it's this hex string number that you've probably seen because they're grouped with ha um, hyphens between groups, like eight, eight hyphen, four hyphen, four more digits. You've seen them a million times. They're in every email you get. It has one internally to identify that email. Some people, like me, use those as identifiers in their database. Uh, in fact, that's the reason I first got attracted to Postgres was that it supports UUID as a data type. Um, there's geometry types for actual shapes. And what that means is the database can actually make sense out of those geometric uh, uh, shapes. There's network, so like the IP numbers, addresses for networking, Postgres actually knows about that. So you can do a search for a range of network numbers, for example. Um, and there's lots more. You can store JSON and XML data, um, which any, if you do any kind of web work uh, uh, is pretty common. Uh, Postgres has some really powerful uh, features for JSON. So it can actually tear apart JSON and identify the elements within it. And you can do a search for uh, an element inside of your JSON document. And also very famous is geo geolocation data. Uh, Postgres, if you, there's an add-on to Postgres called PostGIS for Geographic Information Systems. Extremely powerful, and just leads the industry and so if you're into mapping, you know, like how many customers live within this range or, you know, uh, intersecting um, um, spatial areas, all the geolocation on your phone, all that stuff uh, is extremely powerful. And the point is that it's actually a data type. So location coordinates actually make sense to the database. And again, it can do searches and queries by location. And besides all those other data types, you can actually make your own. Um, and you can get fancy and actually define it. The, the, often the first step people do is they define a domain, a limited set of values. So like you might have types of addresses. I have mailing addresses, I have residential addresses, and I have legal addresses. So you might have a domain of those three values. And you can attach a domain to a column. Um, Oh, here I've got an example of colors where our, we want to use this product's colors with pumpkin, periwinkle, seafoam. So the idea is that when we attach this to the column, then it, the database actually enforces that if you try to insert a record with the color orange, and orange is not one of our three allowed values, the database will actually reject it. So this is um, the first step to creating a type, because now you can actually give this a name and reuse it multiple places uh, throughout your database system. Um, so working, interacting with your database, nowadays pretty much all databases, nearly all of them are doing SQL. Um, uh, that is a acronym, used originally meant structured query language, it's actually one word now. Um, the way that databases work is that it's a black box. We don't know what's inside the database and we don't care. That's the whole point is that the way it stores data on disk and the way that it caches data in memory, that's all up to the database system. So what we're doing is just asking it for data, like select customers who are in the state of Washington, it gives us back a list of those customers. Uh, the technical words is declarative versus imperative. So we're declaring what we want. We're not telling the database how to do it. Imperative, you're doing every little step like regular programming. So it's pretty amazing. In SQL, you can do a tremendous amount of work in just a very few lines of code. Stuff that would take pages and pages of regular programming could be done in one line in, in SQL. So when we start the database, the first thing we do is make a table. There's an example where the SQL, so we're saying create table, do a table name, um, we've got the name up here is dorm room. We've got a unit. We're telling it the data type text and capacity is a 32-bit number. 
And by the way, SQL statements end in a semicolon. A lot of people leave these off. You, you can get away with leaving them off. I recommend always doing it as a habit because uh, you couldn't screw yourself up um, when you don't. It's possible that in some of your programming, you could end up combining lines and not realize it because you had a missing semicolon. Um, there's kind of two different types. Uh, to get your database going, you need to get your uh, database defined. So you have to say, what are my tables? What are my columns? This is DDL for data, data definition language. So there's some SQL commands like create table that are all about getting your database structure set up. And then there's other commands that are all about getting data in and out of it. So for getting data in and out of it, we call that DML, data manipulation uh, language. People just use DDL or DML just because uh, uh, conceptually when you're programming, you're kind of doing one or the other. And there's, they're all commands in Postgres, but it's made two major groups of them. Um, there's a cute little acronym called CRUD, often in programming, called Create, Read, Update, Delete. So um, when you say I'm doing a CRUD screen, it's like you're doing a basic data entry screen. Put in person's first name, last name, phone number. Um, so here are the SQL commands that match those. In SQL, when we do, you can pronounce the SQL as well as SQL. When we do insert, uh, the command for that is, is, or excuse me, for when we're creating records, we use the word insert. When we're reading them, we do select. That gets us back, uh, like select customers who are in Washington. Um, updating means that we're changing the record. So we have an existing record, like. This customer lives in Washington, but they just moved, so now they're in Oregon. So we're changing the Washington field into Oregon. Delete, there's multiple kinds. You can actually delete one row, one record in the database, or you can actually truncate, which means, let's say I have 100,000, and for some reason I know I only need the first 10,000. So you can just uh, drop the last 90,000 out of those 100,000. This is often used with like science, when you're bulk loading scientific data and you know that like um, the first 10,000 are older and the last 80,000 need to be reloaded. We just got fresh replacements for them. The difference is that it's really fast when you do a truncate. Drop means you want to drop the entire table and uh, all of the data in the table and the definition of the table is being dropped. So that's obviously pretty powerful. You can destroy your business very, very quickly by dropping the wrong tables. So there are uh, there's users and groups in Postgres and most databases. You can actually assign roles to the users and say that this user cannot execute drops. So it's to protect yourself. So often you'll have a user for an app. If you're doing like a web app, you'll have a user for the app, and that user doesn't do drop table. Whereas you have another role, there's always a super user role, usually named Postgres, P-O-S-T-G-R-E-S. -E um, that person can do anything and everything, so when you do need to drop a table, you can switch into a different user, but often you're gonna wanna restrict these commands. For example, there might be users who should only be doing selects. They should not be doing updates or inserts. They shouldn't be manipulating the data at all, um, just getting data out. Um, here's an example of the SQL for inserting. So first we say the fields that we want to add data to, um, and then we pass the, the values. So this one, we're adding two different records. The first one is fruit at the bottom. Here's our ISBN number, and there's a description on the end. And then uh, we have a second record, second ISBN, and a second uh, value for the description. So at, when this runs, we know the end because of the semicolon. When this runs, we'll end up with two records in the database. Getting data out, as I said, it's just select. Um, there's a shortcut I use all the time in Postgres called table. This just is the same as saying select star, which is a shortcut for all the columns in the table. So if you notice that last screen, we actually spelled out the columns. You can do that here. For example, maybe you only want the title of your books. You don't want to look at the ISBN in the description. You can say select 
title from book. If you want to see all of the columns and don't spell them out, you put an asterisk. And this is po this is standard. This is Postgres specific. is a little shortcut. Just table, table name, and you get all the all the rows with all the columns. Yeah. Is the trailing underscore required, or is that just kind of? That is my own thing. Um, I actually, uh, he's talking about these, he's noticed a lot of my names, I've got these underscore trailing. Uh, there is, I actually did an analysis one time. I went and started looking at sources of uh, reserved keywords in various databases. So the SQL standard has many different words like select and table. So if you named your table select, or you named your table table, you're probably gonna have problems when you're writing your SQL. So I actually went and looked and said, how many of these words do we really have? Well, besides the SQL standard, all the databases add their own words for special features. And when I titled them up, it was over a thousand words. <laughs> and a lot of them were stuff you wouldn't really think of. Things like date, you might think of, but there were a lot of words that are very common business words. So, and I have been bit by this collision where um, a column name or table name was being misinterpreted as a command. And in the Postgres docs, actually, is what tipped me off. It says somewhere in there, it says the SQL standard specifically states that, any, that it will never use a trailing underscore as, an identif as a keyword. And so, to me, it was like screaming in red letters use a trailing underscore on your identifiers and it will never, there'll never be a database command that's table underscore, for example. At least the standard promises that. So you said that was yeah. a standard SQL thing? Or yeah, the SQL standard promise, it doesn't say to do this, it doesn't yeah. say name, right. it doesn't say name your identifiers with a trailing underscore, it says we, they will the standard committee, will never, ever, in the future, we promise to never have a command or reserve keyword that ends with a trailing underscore. But then the problem is like Postgres or whatever might add something that... Well, hopefully this was like, I don't know the purpose. I've never gotten anybody explain because that's the only character. It doesn't, yeah. I mean, it just says trailing underscore. And I'm like, what? Huh. So anyway, that solved the problem for me is I put trailing underscore in all my identifiers and I never have to worry. I can have a field called date and have date underscore and I right. know it won't collide with the commands. So that's my own thing. I have tried to sort of proselytize that. Um, a lot of times what you see is people do funky abbreviations of words to try to make sure they're not uh, colliding with a keyword. But then they're hard to remember. Yeah, or hard to read when you're new and you're like, what the heck are these abbreviations? So I tend to have long identifiers. You can have pretty long identifiers. These names of columns and tables, I don't know what the limit is, but it's dozens of characters, probably 64, something like that, 63. By the way, I'll mention, there's a lot of limits uh, like that, like the length of an identifier in Postgres. A lot of them you can actually change with settings uh, to your database or to Postgres, but a lot of them are actually set in the hard-coded into the programming of database, of Postgres. And Postgres is actually released by the developers only as source code. They don't release builds directly. Other people make builds from it. So their idea is that people should be compiling their own Postgres. If you ever want to, there are a lot of settings that you can override. Like if you really do want longer identifier names, you could actually change the code and then compile it. And I do know people who compile their Postgres. I don't, I always use um, installers. So what we saw before was just select star from book. We're getting all the rows. What if, if, what if we want a subset of those rows? Well, that's what the where command is for. So we're saying select all the columns from a table called book, and I want to do it where the title on the book is this. And notice we're using uh, single quotes in SQL around the text. And then my semicolon for the end. Uh, this one is very similar. Um, what we're saying is where the title like, instead of an equal sign, we're saying like. And then notice there's a uh, percent sign. That is a wild card. Even though there's uh, single quotes around it, this actually is parsed by Postgres when you've got the like command. It knows that you are looking for any title that has, starts with the word F-R-U-I-T at the beginning. So in this case, we have two rows. Only one of them meet this criteria of fruit at the beginning. Oh, yeah, I've got an example there. You can get fruitcake, 
fruition, so notice it's not just the whole word. Fruition has those five characters at the beginning, so it gets picked up. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, da. Uh, question. Yeah. Is there something that is um, a, a like, but it would be something, uh, let's say you have a frat and fruit, and you have a comment that could say, oh, these words are almost the same. That's oh, like right. frat, F-R-A-T. Or whatever, yeah. whatever. There name. actually is a thing called in the industry called Soundex. If you want, if you meant pronunciations like names, uh, like my name is Bork, B-O-U-R-Q-U-E, which is just French version of Burke, B-U-R-K-E, German style. So um, Soundex is actually a standard, and there's, I think it's been replaced. Soundex is pretty old, but you can Google on Soundex, and you'll see there's actually a standard way for um, to, to uh, analyze words phonetically, the sound of the, the phenomes, and then do a search based on that. So if you say I want to do a Soundex search on Bork, you'd get Bork the French way and Burke with the KE. Both of those would come back. And I've never done that in Postgres. I don't know, I'm sure there's probably an add-on to Postgres to support Soundex. Or if you now, if you meant literally the spelling, similarities in spelling, yeah. I don't know of anything on that. More, like fuzzy, a fuzzy. Uh, no, just a user mistake. Let's say you have an app and a uh -huh. user uh, type in an address. Yeah. And uh, someone will type street and someone with street with a dot. Or yeah, no, space. I don't know of anything to do that. That would be considered fuzzy, fuzzy logic searching. And there's probably, uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe there's add-ons to Postgres to do that. I don't know. Yeah. No, but normally, uh, actually, normally databases are very strict about the data goes in them and very strict about these queries. So um, what you type here is exactly what you're going to get um, to the point of including case. So there are other ways to, if you want case insensitive searching, there's other ways to do that too. But by default, it's actually case sensitive. So it's just the opposite. It's very strict in searching. So um, I said before, the database is a, is a black box. So how do we interact with it? Well, um, one way, the typical way is users are going to use an app that you build web app or a desktop app um, or a mobile app, and the app is going to communicate with the database indirectly. Usually there's going to be a layer in between, a driver or a library. So if you're doing Java, there's JDBC, for short for Java Database Connectivity. So in Java, there's JDBC drivers. If you're using Python for your app, there's going to be a Python library that knows how to talk to Postgres. <coughs> if you're going to do a C app, um, there's a C driver, often it's the C driver that's being wrapped, for example, by the Python driver. Um, the other way is you can go straight in on command line uh, and talk to Postgres. Um, so you can use a terminal app, like the terminal app on named terminal on a Mac. Um, then uh, when you're at that command line, you would invoke PSQL is the name of a command line shell app that's already been written and it's bundled, usually bundled with Postgres. So PSQL inside of it has a library to talk to the Postgres library, uh, I mean to the database engine. So um, then what you do is you learn a bunch of the PSQL commands for you know, executing. You can do individual commands like do a select and then immediately see the results on the screen. Um. There's a different way than the command line. I've never used PSQL, actually, because uh, I'm a Mac kind of guy. So I hope, is that really jumping, or is it me? Just jumping around. Yeah, all, off and on, OK. Um, um, so what I do instead is use a admin app. That is so weird. Not me. Okay, so I use an admin app. There's a free app that comes with Postgres called PG Admin, short for, oh, in the Postgres world, everything's PG this, PG that. So it's just short for Postgres. Um, 
So PG Admin is the, the system or database administrator's app for working with Postgres. And there's the old PG Admin I was just getting used to. I even reported bugs that were getting fixed. And then they came out with a whole new one. PG Admin 4 is entirely different than the old one. And it's been quite buggy, to be frank. Um, the old one, I was happy enough to use most of the time. The new one has been problematic, but it's getting better. The reason it's, it, it's kind of funky in its architecture because they are doing, um, it's a web server. Even though you don't realize, you're just using it on your own machine, it actually starts internally a little web server and then you make a connection through a web browser. And then you interact with, through their app. So it works. Like I said, it's kind of clunky, it's getting better. Um, but there are lots of other, I mean dozens of other apps that you can choose to um, uh, use that know how to talk to Postgres and can do all the, all the uh, interactive work, like showing you what your tables are, showing you what your columns are, looking at the data, um, all the kind of, it's like the back door into your database. That's how I think of it. As I said at the top, what I do is build web apps using Modin, which is uh, Java-based, Java on the back end, and then it generates on the fly all the standard web stuff to run my app. <laughs> so in Java, I say I want a form. Here I want the first name field, I want a last name field, I want a phone number, and I want a button that says save. Um, all that gets rendered in HTML on the fly. So on the back end, on the server side, my Java is using JDBC to talk to Postgres. Now what that means is that my, this is running on a server, in my case with Modin, the Java's running on a server side. That can be on the same machine with Postgres or it can be a separate machine, that's your choice. Uh, there's pros and cons to doing that. One pro is that if your app, if it is a server-based app, having it on the same machine with Postgres means that there's no networking. So networking is always immensely slower than a local connection. So that's the upside, is that you don't have networking, so it's very fast connections. The downside is that both Postgres and your web app is fighting each other for you know, all the resources on the machine, memory and um, CPU and so on. I'll do another mention too. Postgres has great features now for replication, which means as data goes into the Postgres database, you can have that data sent out to a second Postgres running on another machine. So that's a great way to do for safety reliability. If the primary machine with Postgres dies, the secondary machine can be um, switched on to take over its job and, be, and become the primary. Can you talk about that this afternoon? Yes, yes. And there's some guys with a lot of experience in that here, too. Yeah. That is a... Uh, well, I'll mention that is an example of one of the things I like about Postgres is that it, they have very sane, kind of slow engineering. They plan stuff out years in advance. So I mean, it's slow in that a lot of open source projects, they just whatever somebody wants to do this week, they do it, and then next week they've forgotten about it. Postgres, they plan it out. It's very uh, disciplined engineering. So a lot of these features build. A lot of, sometimes they come out with something that seems quite kind of small and you don't realize that it's actually the foundation for future um, features. So the way Postgres works, another safety feature is called the write-ahead log. I don't know if I have it in here or not. Write-ahead log says as the data comes into the database, it actually writes it out to a write-ahead log, meaning it actually physically writes it into disk. Then it writes it into the database. So the idea is that if you have a crash in the middle of writing it to the database, it actually knows that that record's half written. And when you start up the database again, it gets rid of the half written one, goes back to the wall file and says, what was the whole record? Let's try it again. So you don't get a corrupted database and you don't get half a written record in your database. Well, that's an example wall they did many years ago. Well, this replication, the way it works is they send the wall file to another machine. So it's a great example of how they have one feature that ends up becoming another feature later on and also shows you how safe Postgres is. Their number one priority is saving your data. Not true of all databases. I've heard some nightmares of MySQL databases getting totally destroyed, and um, that doesn't happen in Postgres, if you have good hardware. <laughs> you always gotta have good hardware. <clears throat> um, so this is an example of what I was saying is an app where this is a modern uh, web app that is showing the, the columns of data um, inside of a web browser. 
So it just gets you the idea that the data that you see on screen is not the data that's in the database and Postgres allows multiple people to be working on the same data at the same time. It's a whole other topic, uh, but um, it does change control to manage that in a same way so that people can actually see different versions of data at the same time. So when you, as you, as my botnap went and did a query and got back a list of data, some of these records might actually be changing right now at the same time by other people. And the, that's one of the main jobs of a database engine is to allow that multiple people changing multiple things at the same time. So let's talk about primary keys um, because we have to identify all the rows. One of the rules is every table, you've got to have a column that can distinguish one row from all the other rows. So when we had a lot of a list of books, every book we have to be able to, you know, two books can have the same title. That's actually legal. There's no copyright on titles. So you might have five books with the same title. How do you separate them? You need to have something on there. There's two ways to do that. Um, usually, one way is you can look at your data itself and say, is there something unique about it? So for example, employees have an employee ID on almost every company. So that could be your identifier to identify in the employee table, it's just use their own badge number or, or employee uh, hire number. These are called natural keys, natural in the sense that it's in your data that you already have. The other way around it is you add uh, an extra column and it's artificial data that you are generating and sticking onto the record when you save it to the database. So this is called a surrogate key uh, uh, as opposed to uh, the opposite of the natural key. And usually these are going to be of two data types. They're going to be a sequence number, one, two, three, four, five. Um, almost every database will actually generate and manage these sequences for you. Because of what I said a moment ago about multiple people doing multiple things at the same time, what if you increment the number to five, but you end up not saving that record? Um, somebody else has already been adding a record while you were fooling around with yours. They incremented the number to six. So you don't want to be repeating numbers. Managing that whole generation of the sequence is actually tricky. So the database will do that for you. The other way to do it is the UUID that I mentioned before, the 128-bit value. The way these work is a UUID, you take the current moment and um, you take the, uh, well, conceptually this is called a point in space and time. So the space is the identifier of the machine itself, which uh, commonly is the MAC address. There's an MAC is the MAC address of every Ethernet card, every Wi-Fi card has burned into it a, a unique number. So the idea, this is a decades old idea, is that if you take that, plus you take the current moment from the clock, and you know clocks can get reset or adjusted a little bit forward, a little bit, you know, may slow down or speed up. So if you take, thirdly, a random, a little tiny random number, uh, or a sequencing little number, like one through 16, and so every time you detect a change on the clock, you change that number, that random number, to like from seven to eight. So now you're not going to likely get, because these current moments we're talking about to a fraction of a tiny fraction of a second. So you have virtually eliminated any possibility of having collisions. There are other versions of UUID. This is the, the original classic version was this uh, point in space and time. So I use UUIDs a lot. The problem is that because it is this kind of randomized number, uh, it's not in order when you have a bunch of them that when you get millions of records, it can be a little inefficient for the database to be searching and, and um, storing those. Um, but it's not really an issue until you get to millions and millions of records. So I use UUIDs all the time. More common is to use the sequence. Although I think UUIDs is getting more and more common. Oh, one other re thing to think about is if you're gonna share this data with other databases or other systems, um, let's say that you're keeping track of books. Well, you're going to interface with some other subsidiary that's also keeping track of books. Well, when you try to merge your data together, you're both going to have records that have number one and both going to have records that are number two and so on. That's when the UUID is a good idea because now you can each generate your own UUIDs without checking in on each other. But when you merge your data together, you know you won't have collisions. 
So let's go back and look at the um, create table. This is um, the proper way to do a table is that besides us saying a dorm room has a unit and a capacity, we also need to say that it will um, generate, uh, this is a new command, in, a new standard command in Postgres, saying I want to use numbers and I want to make, uh, well, I want to use numbers and I want this generated by default as identity says, uh, manage it all for me. Generate the numbers and slap them into these, uh, this field every time I uh, add records. Then the last part is the primary key. You need, to identify, you need to tell the database that this is my special column that identifies all my dorm rooms from all the other dorm rooms. So it's not obvious to the database. Even though typically people use words like ID or P key for primary key, you still have to tell the database explicitly this is my primary key. Um, here is an example where the ISBN number is an international standard. There's an organization that hands out these numbers to book to publishers for their books. So here we don't need to generate it. This is a surrogate key. This is a natural key because the ISBN itself should be a unique number. Um, let's see. Oh, we only got a few minutes. I'm going to skip this section because I'm actually doing this the next hour. It's talking about more about the keys and relating tables to each other. I'm going to skip that for now. And um, well, let's talk about leave you with one big ex big concept when we end here. Um, let's see. Well, that's, that's going to be too much to do in a few minutes. Let's talk about, let's talk about working with your records, sorting and um, summarizing them. So in SQL, you can do an order by. That means sort. So I'm saying I want to select all my customers. Uh, we're doing some of the joins with other tables. But I want to select these, and I want to sort by this invoice total field. And the DESC is descending or ascending, A to Z or Z to A, or small numbers to big numbers. So that's super powerful, of course. Uh, a lot of programmers do this kind of stuff in their app, and they shouldn't. It's like um, a lot of programmers are not comfortable with databases, by the way. If you are into programming, adding database skills puts you way ahead in the resume game. Because uh, it's surprising how many developers don't really understand relational databases and don't kind of they're scared of it almost. Um, so what they do is they download all this data. They, they just do the select star, give me the whole table, all the columns, bring it down to my app. Now I'm using up huge amounts of memory in my app. Um, whereas Postgres is optimized on how to keep some of the data on disk and some of the data in memory. Your app is not. So now you've just got all this data in memory. You only want a small subset of it. Now you're using Java or Python or whatever, and you're searching and sorting through your rows. Not a good idea. You want to try to do as much as you can on the database server. So searching and sorting should be done on the database server. And you can do smart um, things like aggregate, which means group them together and come up with totals. So the group by is the way you identify how you want to group them or chunk them together. And then you can say things like, give me a total for this. You know, for each, uh, you know, for white wines and red wines, I want to I want a total sales for the white wine. I want a total sales for the red wine. And we are just about out of time. I'll mention two more things here real quick. Um, we talked a lot about tables and the rows inside them. There is more grouping. There's a hierarchy of grouping of tables. You can bundle a bunch of tables together um, and give that group a name. That's called a schema. This is defined by the SQL standard, and Postgres offer, um, offers all of these. A lot of databases do not. Um, you can have multiple schemas go to get, for example, uh, you might have like a, uh, well, one for invoicing and one for, for purchase orders. You might have a bunch of tables related to invoicing, and you want to group them together. And then you might want the purchase orders grouped together those tables together. 
Why group them? Well, one reason is it's a security boundary. You can actually, remember I talked about having the users, you can have give roles to users. You can say these users can go, only go into the schema for purchase orders. And so what that means is when you add future tables in the, uh, to that schema, you don't have to assign the role, the permission security roles to all the tables, each individually. You can just do it at the schema level. It's also sometimes just nice to organize so you don't have to look at all your tables all the time. You can have one or more schema in a catalog. That is your database. What we typically call a database is a catalog in the SQL standard. Um, you see both of these words used, I think, in the documentation for Postgres. Furthermore, we have a cluster, which is what if you have multiple databases? Um, the difference, the, the, I should put this little point on this slide here that says, um, um, actually, let me take it up. This one, cluster is one or more of the databases that can be totally un, um, unrelated to each other. The cluster is the only reason why you'd have more than one cluster of is usually versions. So you might be trying out version 11 Postgres right now, um, but you're still working in Postgres 10 for all your real work. So you could have a development machine, for example, where you have both of those installed. Um, that would be an example of two Postgres clusters on the same machine. Inside of those, you can have lots of databases. You can only, when you do a connection to Postgres, you're always connecting to one cluster and you're always connecting into a specific database. So to get you started, when you install Postgres, there is a database catalog called public, public, yeah, I think it's public, P-U-B-L-I-C. And um, um, there's also a schema called public, I believe, as well. Sorry, it's been a long drive this morning. My memory's starting to fade. But yes, I believe they're both called public, and that's just to get you started. So often what we do is we create our own database uh, and um, schema name just so that you don't want to use the default by purpose. You want to have your programming you always say, I want to go into this schema or that schema. So you might keep your public one empty on purpose. Technically, you can delete it. I don't think most people do. <clears throat> Last topic, just for a little over time. Um, no. What happens when you don't have the data yet? So uh, let's say you're putting in the person record, first name, last name, and a phone number. They don't have their phone number with them right now, or they don't remember it. So what do you put in for the phone number if you haven't collected that data yet? Well, you could put in a bogus value, like 000, area code, whatever, 555, like the movies. The other thing you can do is put in a null. So null means that there's no value. It's not the word null, but Null, M-U-L-L, -L is what you'll see when you query the database. You're trying to, when it's trying to show you, there's nothing to show you, literally nothing, so it will show you N-U-L-L. -L. Um, Chris Gate is one of the co-inventors for relational databases. Basically, I agree with him, it's kind of the work of the devil. This causes all kinds of problems, like searching and sorting. Different databases will put nulls, consider them at the top or at the bottom when you're, remember the ascending, descending I mentioned? So I suggest you try to avoid this. When you define your tables, when we're setting up the columns, you can actually say not null. And it means on this column, like phone number, I never want to allow null. Um, and so if you, if you insert a, data, a record into that first name, last name, and the phone number is missing, the database will reject it and say, you know what, you're not allowed to have uh, null values on phone number in this database. So that's your last concept. I think we're out of time. If you stick around 20 or 30 minutes, I'm going to do kind of a follow-up and talk more about the table connecting and the joins that I had to kind of skip over here. And that's it. I can go over this if you guys are hanging around, but otherwise you can go to another talk. You're still here, so I'll keep talking. Um, why use a database server? Um, Years ago, I remember I was involved in a medical study and I was talking to this physician, really smart gal, and she's like, I'm telling her what I do. And she, she does medical studies. And she goes, well, I don't understand why do you need a database. It just, you could just do all that in a spreadsheet. So I was explaining rows and columns. So it kind of was funny that she is managing all this data for medical studies but doesn't understand the, the point. 
Well, here are the points. Why do we want to use a database instead of a spreadsheet? Well, a spreadsheet is, is not rigid, and you can type anything into any column. You, know, you can call a column date and another one phone number. You could type the date into the phone number column. It's not going to stop them unless you try to put some coding on it, but you can always get around that, you know, with the formulas. So one rule is, is that it's um, very rigid in the data. The other one is that we can set up rules uh, like a check constraint. So you can say uh, on dates, birth date, date cannot be before 1900. So every time a row goes into the database, the database engine itself looks at the date, figures out the year, and sees that if it is before 1900, it rejects that row and doesn't let you put it in the database. So your app will get an error saying you violated the check constraint. The, the, the web apps actually did, did it that way or the check at the app level? Well, normally this kind of work, you want to do it in your app. So in your Python or Java, yeah, I would check the birth date, make sure it's not before 1900. But app developers often go kind of crazy and don't always think about all these rules. So this is a great double check. So if they fail and don't check for uh, you know, uh, crazy birth dates, if they try to submit 1600 as a birth date, then this check constraint will kick in and the database will throw the data back to the, to the app and say, no go. It'll say, I have an error from your last, when you did an insert command into the database, you violated this check constraint. Check me and I'm going to check your data for you. So it doesn't solve your problem, but it's a lot better. The whole idea of database is kind of like a fortress, you know, with walls around it, and you want to stop bad data from getting in. So it's the app's problem what to do with that. You know, there's no solution to this. You throw it back to the app, you give them a check constraint error, the app needs to deal with that. Now, maybe it goes back to the user and says, oops, you're, you've got a bad birthday. Another big reason to use a database server is that you have code on the um, server itself. So now there's the, the, why would you want code running inside your server? Well, it's closer to the database. It's actually in the database engine. So we're not getting data out of the database engine and over to your app. So you get a huge speed benefit when dealing with like enormous amounts of data. Um, another reason is, is that you can put, it's like a nice central spot to put some logic. Like let's say you have some complicated logic to do, uh, like show me all the invoices that are related to some kind of a, um, like I did a, a advertising app uh, for years. So I want all the newspaper ads. So I want to find all the newspaper ads, but I want to exclude certain kind of newspaper ads that don't really count. So you can do all this crazy logic, give it a name, uh, and then put that in the database server. Now the app developers don't need to know about the crazy rules about how well it's most newspapers, but it's not these newspapers because their circulation is too small. All that kind of weird definitions that managers invent. You can put it in the code, give it a name, and now the app developers, instead of writing select from where, all they do is they say, I want to run this procedure named uh, last quarter newspaper ads. And then boom, they get back what they want. So a stored procedure is just basically some SQL inside, right? Or it's, it can it, be more complex. It can be if it's just, well, there's SQL, but SQL is not a full programming language. It doesn't have for loops and if statements and that kind of stuff. There's an extension of SQL. All the big databases like Oracle, um, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, and Postgres, they all have a superset of SQL. So yes, you can write what looks like SQL, but with if statements and for loops and other programming. And that is usually called PL for programming language, slash, and then something SQL. So if the Postgres version is PL slash PGSQL. That's a mouthful. I wish there was a shorter way to say it. This is very common to use in Postgres when you're writing the server-side code. Um, you can write other, this is not the only language inside Postgres. You can write Perl, Python, Java, there's like at least half a dozen I've heard of. Um, some come by default. Perl and Python, I've, Perl at least is, is, comes usually with every Postgres. Um, Java, you would add on a module that would then know how to run the Java inside of this context. 
of data of pro Postgres. Does that make sense? You don't, uh, uh, I mean, you could have a whole career and write a whole lot of databases and apps and never use that feature. But when you need it, it's really nice. So for example, there's a fellow that um, hosts our Seattle Postgres user group over there. He works at Fred Hutch. Uh, there's a division that does all the AIDS research in the whole world, all the clinical AIDS research. They all store their data with him, his databases, uh, at the Fred Hutch. Um, so what he had, they have a whole programming team, but often what happens is they get stuck like writing reports that take hours, or literally days. He'll go back and take apart their Java code, figure out the logic, and he'll rewrite it in like PLP, GSQL, in the database, and stuff will go from days to hours or hours to minutes um, just by having it run inside the database server. Um, yeah, he's done some amazing presentations, some of which are on online too, by the way. Um, triggers. Uh, t -t 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 -t. Yeah, okay, so this is kind of like a, a version of this code, server side code. You can actually tell the database that every time I insert a row into the book table, I want you to run some code. And that code can actually look at the record, um, um, uh, well, that's, I'll skip that thought. Um, so you can say every time I insert the record, I want this code to run. So what it can do, for example, is do something more complicated than a check constraint. So like maybe birth, uh, maybe not birthdays, but maybe uh, some kind of numeric value. You want some sort of range like one through 10, unless this record is about, has another field with another value. Well then we want the range to be one to 100. So maybe it's like a large data sample versus a small data sample. So there's another field that says large versus small. Well now you need to write code that says, well if the field is marked small, then I want this value to be between one and 10. But if the other field is marked large, then I want the value to be one to 100. That's more fancy than a check constraint. So now you're writing your own trigger, and then in your trigger you say, if it doesn't meet this criteria, bounce the record back to the, U, to the app developer. They're also great for um, time and date stamping. For, um, yes, you can do automatic things, right. Yeah. So yes, so for example, if you want to insert default values, um, you could actually, uh, you can do all kinds of crazy things. You could update like a date time. So I often have a field on my tables that is when modified or when last modified. So every time any of the fields change or maybe a subset of the fields change that I care about, I update this date time. So at a glance, I can tell the records have been modified. And often that's a great debugging tool when people are saying something screwed with the database. I go, well look, you know, four minutes ago this record got changed. So that's the kind of stuff you can put in triggers. Speaking of that, you can do an audit. If you take that idea on steroids, it's an audit trail. So what you're saying is, every time certain things get done to a row, I want to write into another table log history of what got changed. So that's how you do it in a trigger. And by doing it, the trigger is, it doesn't matter how, what commands got called where. Whenever the row gets updated, I want to look at the values and if change values on those fields, I want to write them in my audit trail table. And now I've got a nice um, history. Concurrency, um, I mentioned earlier, multiple people doing multiple things. If you look up the word ACID in Wikipedia, ACID is an acronym. Uh, it'll explain the concepts uh, for, these are basically the problems that you want solved by your database. And the database server does that for you. Um, I mentioned the wall file earlier with safety, crashing and partial. And last, I already mentioned this too, there's efficiency. So the whole managing what's stored on disk and what's stored in memory temporarily, uh, the database handles all that and is super optimized for it. So the problem, a lot of programmers think they're so clever. They're not as clever as the people that have been working for decades on Postgres. So, um, and that's another reason why you want to do as much work in the database and not in your app that you can. Because this kind, you'll get huge efficiency gains and performance. And that's it for now.